You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. We've got our guests, so uh, let me bring them right on. And um, I'm excited to have uh, George Landreth, uh, who is the president of Frontiers of Freedom, uh, back with us on the program. And this is a very interesting story. And uh, it's regarding the uh, Kenosha, well, the idea to and proposal to build a uh, gaming casino in the Kenosha uh, called the uh, sorry Kenosha Casino in Wisconsin. And uh, George, first of all, welcome back to the program. And I, I think what's most interesting to me is the fact that this casino, and correct me if I'm wrong, is about 150, 180 miles off of the uh, territory of this tribe. And so that is kind of uh, new territory, isn't it? It is. It makes it kind of difficult to um, to look at it the way the other ones are done. Historically, the whole rationale behind um, the Department of Interior approving these and then giving them to the governors to make the final approval on was that the um, jobs would be close to or on the reservation and therefore provide economic opportunity for um, the reservation and resources uh, for the reservation, the scholarships, things like that. 180 miles is a really long commute. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, it, it, it kind of, it essentially just basically, I think, starts to sound like we want to run a casino somewhere where we've done some market research and we think it'd be really good there. Yeah. Um, but it, it no longer is about economic development for a, um Indian tribe, and, and that was kind of the, the whole point of it. And, uh, yeah, I'm just looking here. I just found a number. It's 160 miles. I mean, that, that's pretty far off the reservation, if you will. And uh, so this is the, uh, I hope I have this right, the Menominee Tribe. I, I believe there's 11 existing uh, tribes in Wisconsin. And uh, Governor Scott Walker, it seems, has set up a, um, you know, a, a standard that he thinks should be followed to approve any uh, new uh um, gaming casinos with regards to the um, Indian reservations, and I, I think it makes sense. And when you look at this, it seems to me that he's saying, "Hey, if the community itself first wants to do this, and it meets the guidelines, it's safe for the community and, and things of that nature, then we're all for this." But it can't have a negative impact on the existing people, or, or they're gaining an unfair advantage over uh, those who have already established in the other tribes. And I think that's exactly. part of the issue here. Right. I mean, he he set up a essentially a three part test. One was that the um, the Indian tribes reach a consensus on on the new uh, casino. The other, as you mentioned, is that the locality where they're going to build the casino approves. Now, if it's going to be built on the reservation, that makes it easy because the Indian uh, reservation presumably wouldn't be building if they didn't approve. But when they're building it somewhere 160 miles away, then the, the locals there uh, have a, probably a right to have a say as to whether or not they'll have a, a another casino there. And then, um, and then the last one was just uh, to acknowledge the will of the people of Wisconsin who held a um, a statewide referenda and said that they did not want to have a net increase, you know, no no additional gambling going on. There's 24 different casinos. That's a in a, in a, in a state the size of um, Wisconsin. That's a lot. And I think the public's saying we don't want one on every street corner. So yeah, that is, that is a like, lot. <laughs> yeah, and, and so they're saying we'd like to kind of keep it at the current level. We're not asking to shut down. We're not asking anybody to stop. But we don't want to just keep proliferating. It's you know these don't need to be like uh, the corner gas station, and and that's a reasonable. So that so that so essentially, um, Scott Walker said we're going to give voice to the people of the state who voted. We're going to give voice to the local people who will be impacted, and we're going to have the Indians give their voice through consensus on this plan. And if that all works out, then we can go forward with it. And if not, then we won't. And that just strikes me as. Um, a pretty rational way to approach it, but what I like about it most is it strikes me as not a what I would call um, well. It's just so often when a when a governor is asked to make a big decision, he just kind of basically you know gives some amorphous sort of uh, standard and then says, "I'll just listen to people and they'll talk to me." And it almost to me sounds like an invitation to cozy up to the governor and make promises. 
and um, of you know help for allies or whatever. And some of it might be a little shady, and some of it's probably perfectly legal. But we really ought to be making decisions on, on the merits, not based on who's uh, willing to be most helpful on campaigns. And um, and the governor has not done that. I mean, he's created um, a, a stark contrast to the old smoke room filled things where you sit around and and make promises and you know swap horses or whatever it is you do in those smoke filled rooms. And he's made it very transparent. He's given three standards. They're rational, reasonable standards. He's not put himself in a position where he's going to be, um, you know, playing the old-fashioned, you know, political games. And I like that. I mean, that's kind of what I think most Americans want, is we're tired of the old politicians who do things that are a little bit, uh, you know, odd and a little bit weird. And yep. uh, we're looking forward that's to That's exactly you know, right. Yeah. I mean, that you know, I know that, that that's what I when, – anytime you talk about a politician – that's almost a dirty word to call someone a politician. Why is that? Because we don't expect a lot from him. And I think Scott Walker is breaking that mold and showing us that he's a leader, not a politician. I agree with you on that. Now, there's a, you know, we're just discussing this so far, really on a more uh, a state level, but it seems to me that there's a difference um, from the decisions that were made under the uh, Bush administration and then this current administration, where there seems to be a lot of easing going on in the, the approvals and also the oversight of um, all these casino operations. And, of course, this is falling under the uh, uh, Department of the Interior, and uh, I believe the Secretary's uh, Sally Jewell um, has given her approval to this. But, of course, you know what we're discussing here is that ultimately the governor has to also give his approval. So here's two right. questions I have for you bringing that up. Um, it, one is... Is there a burden on the uh, United States taxpayer because of some of the decisions that are being made now and, and the, the easing of, of some of these regulations? And two, and I'm, I'm not sure of this answer actually, do any taxes, are there any, is there any taxation of the money or income made on these um, casinos that go to the uh, federal coffers or is it all kept within the uh, Indian tribes? Um, you know, I on the first question in terms of federal funds, one of the things that's interesting about this issue is that um, initially these casinos were designed to create resources so that the Indian tribes, which are often treated as essentially separate nations, that they would have the resources to provide uh, scholarships, educational opportunities, social programs, etc. It was a revenue driver for them so that they could um, essentially help the Indian tribe. And um, what's interesting is is that as those revenues have fallen, as the economy has kind of been on its back, <laughs> the the, the um, the, there's been pressure on the federal government to step in and, and essentially make up the difference and to provide more social service help. And um, that's kind of interesting. I mean, I, you know, I, so, so the answer is I don't know if there's money that goes into supporting the casinos per se, but we have seen um, and heard of um, federal um, bureaucrats helping uh, Indians find, Indian tribes find ways to qualify for government grants and other things to make up for lost revenue as the economy has failed. And um, I don't know about you, but I wasn't really aware that it was our responsibility to help people make up for, you know, because when, when the economy goes down for me, the government doesn't offer to give me grants to make, make up the difference. Um, so that's one way the taxpayer gets paid. Now, the other question I believe you asked was, is, do they pay tax back into the federal coffers? And, you know, I do not know the answer to that question. I, part of me wants to say it's, it seems, well, this is the issue. Um, I wonder if it's, in fact, done because they are treated, in, in, in some respects, as, as being sovereign uh, nations. And it would be odd for one sovereign nation to pay tax to another. But, but other than that, I don't know the answer. I, I don't know. I should, I should find that out. Yeah, George, I'm not actually sure what the sovereign nation status grants. I, I believe there's it's a combination, if I recall. I think there are certain. Yeah, it's a little bit of a hybrid. I think you're right about that. I mean, they're not quite the same as France and England, but um, as, as, as as is kind of obvious just from looking at a map, uh, we don't have. But at the same time, um, it is treated somewhat differently. So I, I do not know for sure. And so 
that's why I'm uh, unable to give you a, a definite response as to whether or not they're paying taxes. You know, George, there's a couple of interesting observations here. One is even just the word transparency, right? Part of the issue that that really bothers me in this entire thing is you know, we talk about transparency where it really needs to be in government, but the transparency that this uh, this casino process is leading to is the transparency where voters no longer have a right. And this is a big problem with these union cards, right, where voters can no longer have the privacy of the vote whether they want to participate in the unions uh, or not. And I have a huge problem with that, and I want to get your opinion on that. But before I do, I want to wrap it in the context of the fact that the AFL-CIO president, Richard Trumka, actually has, uh, in his own words, what he refers to as a corporate campaign. It's a, it's a death of a thousand cuts tactic, and they've, they've used it against companies, they've used it against politicians, government, uh, you know, et cetera. And what they do is they go after them in every way, shape, and form, so they actually, before they even get to the individuals to be forced to have to have these open ballots, uh, they they wrap it in a package that they almost force upon the higher uh, the, the higher ups who will be making the business decision or the political decision, and then they wrap it under the wrapper again in their own words of common good or social justice. And so, if you put it in that context, how you know how in any way do we ever get control of this situation back and even protect the individual who, you know, in my, in my opinion, the unions are actually undermining because of lack of transparency means you'll be targeted at minimum for job loss if you don't vote the way uh, the thugs, uh, basically this is an organized crime syndicate, is it not? Well, yeah, I, I do think there's some uh, very troubling things going on with the unions. The unions are, are, are having a difficult time with uh, membership, largely because I think more and more Americans realize there's not a lot of advantage to being in a union, and that generally speaking, making yourself a valuable employee is the best way to improve your lot economically. But the union just costs you money and, and ends up supporting things you don't support. So they, as a result of that, they've upped their ante a little bit. And the union, I think, has is, is become... Uh, even more negative than it was before, using trying to get in place laws that essentially will uh, legitimize and legalize some of the thuggery that they're uh, known to do, and um, and that's a, uh, there's a little bit of a subtext this whole issue here because the, um, on it, on the uh, labor issue because the Bush administration was given the same exact application and its uh, Department of Interior rejected it because it didn't understand and didn't believe that uh, 160 miles away was in keeping with the whole point of the statute that, uh, that allowed these sorts of things to move forward. So when Obama came into office, this was resubmitted, and they promised to make it a, a union um, casino. And so then all of a sudden it was fast-tracked through and got the approval. And I think um, that's problematic because I don't see why the federal government should be involved in approving something because it's union and disapproving it because, you know, it, it, just, it seems to me that all you really end up with there is you've got um, a, an administration that seems to be in league with unions, and so therefore if you promise to be unions, you can get special treatment. Not, not a good policy. That's just not the right reason to approve things. Um, you know, it's frustrating, but um, but that's I think almost an inescapable conclusion from part of this is that there's a union subtext to this, and um, and I agree with you. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with some of their tactics, and uh, I I understand people have a right to organize. I don't dispute that people you have a right, uh, you know, under the Constitution of freedom of association, but the labor law is used well beyond that. And um, it's used to compel and to strong arm and to blackmail people, and that's not part of freedom of association. No, that's absolutely right. It, it seems like it's a continuation by the administration of the the whole recall thing that went on in Wisconsin, which is you know really a, a big waste of time and a lot of money, if you ask me. But I actually I just googled my question, <laughs> and I see an article in Forbes from last year regarding the taxation. And uh, tribes are tax-exempt. Uh, gaming on Native American lands earned $26.5 billion in 2011. 236 exactly. Native American tribes uh, operate 422 facilities across 28 states. And so the gaming itself is tax-exempt, and it, and it applies to everything, whether they're uh, selling commercial goods or, or whatnot. But what does get taxed is when the individual Native Americans are paid 
uh, by the casinos, that money is taxed as they're still considered a, to be U.S. citizens. Yeah, as a normal so, employee. So the it, so the entity uh, is tax exempt, but the employees pay tax. Yes, and, it, and all they that can tells set me up, is the employees need to get better lobbyists. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and, Isn't that how it always works? You know, it's it, it's the unions who get um, uh, exemption from Obamacare, but you and I, you know, you and I will be uh, fined if we don't comply. Yet, if we try to comply, we can't get on the website. Yeah, it, you know, it, it is it, interesting. It is we need much, much better lobbyists. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, the Ameri- yes, yes, the American individual definitely needs a better lobby. I thought we were supposed to have that and called members of Congress, but <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought too. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's the whole idea. <laughs> anyway, and, and, uh, and there's certainly at least one house that, who's prepared to do that. The good news, of course, is, is there's some other um, in the Senate. There's a growing support for the idea of, of giving an exemption to uh, the rest of us for a year as well. Which I think is very funny because we were told the Republicans shut down the government. Now we're now you hear Democrats saying that they should do exactly what the Republicans said they wanted done. You know, three weeks it, later, it's kind of like, where were you guys? Well, really, what it comes down to is it, it, uh, it, uh, we have a general media that instead of just really discussing in a fair manner all the issues, they really do take one side of the issue too often, in my opinion. And I think no, I that. Agree when you give the other side the free right to reign, then it, it's hard for the other side to make the arguments, and and so you're you're always playing from behind. And I think that's uh, it's sad because the American people, in the end, always seem to lose, and and we have. I mean, we've spent, you know, when we look at Obamacare, and I know it's not the issue we're, we're discussing, but it's just like all these issues. We spend a lot of money. It's taxpayer money. It gets wasted. And then when we want to do something about it, and in this case, we're worried about the fraud, corruption, and crime that can stem from a Kenosha casino, possibly. Anytime we speak up, we, we're always called one name or another, or we're attacked by one side or another. And the fact is that, it, uh, you know, as citizens and as uh, government representatives, we have a duty to protect the or the people they represent and the uh and uh, the best and common good of the people. Yeah, so. Absolutely. And, 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 and on that note, that uh, to me is what I think Scott Walker has done. Yes. He understands, um, it, one, he's, he's, he's listening to the, in, the Native American community on this question. Mm-hmm. He's listening to the local community that will be affected by it. And he's listening to the wider state community spoken on the question of, of you know, expansion of, of casinos. He's listening to all of them. He said, each of you need to be involved in this decision. And so, you know, a lot of times when and, – and while the subtext is unions, he's not tried to make it about that. But I think he understands that um, it's not in um, – it's not in Wisconsin's interest to simply turn the state over to unions. Um, if there's no question that individuals have a right to unionize if they want to, but they don't necessarily want to be bullied by unions, and um, and there is a difference. And like I said, it's a freedom of association issue for me. People have a right to, to freedom of association. I just wish the unions would agree with that because they seem to want to force to force association. And and um, that's problematic. I don't want to be forced into associations, but but I certainly want the ability to. Uh, that'd be like forced speech, <laughs> you know. I want free speech, not forced speech. I want freedom of association, not forced associations. And um, and I appreciate Governor Walker, uh, quite frankly, fighting that fight as well, because um, freedom and opportunity are worth defending. And too many politicians spend time. Uh, licking their fingers, sticking it in the wind, and saying, uh, you know, what's going to curry favor with the largest number, uh, or with, right. or with people that can benefit them or help them. Sometimes it's not the largest number; it's the loudest number, or the biggest contributing number, or any of those kinds of things. And he hasn't done that. And I, you know, I think that's great. That's, you know, it's we're all cynical about politicians, and I think. You know, Governor Walker, in my opinion, is is an example of somebody who's giving us a reason to not be cynical and to begin to realize you can elect people who will lead and will lead in a good direction and will be fair and will be transparent to the public and let you know what they're doing and why they're doing it and that they'll do it in a way that involves all the stakeholders so that they don't act in an autocratic fashion, but they allow the stakeholders to have a voice in the decision. So 
all of that to me is very positive. And um, this issue will eventually be decided. It will eventually go away. But I hope this approach to issues does not go away. I hope we continue to see that kind of leadership out of Scott Walker and I would hope hundreds and hundreds of leaders in Washington that uh, are in the Congress and, and uh, of course, around in the 50 states. So it's yeah. what the founders were hoping for when they founded this country. The, the interesting thing is, and I, I, I think Scott Walker has certainly demonstrated the skill sets necessary to be considered, at the very least, to run for uh, the office of the president in 2016. And I, I think we've learned I something from some of these governors. It's not just Scott Walker. You, you've seen with some of the things that happened in Louisiana, Bobby Jindal, some of the other states, you've seen some good governors come in and turn their economies around, creating jobs, um, confronting a lot of uh, budgetary issues and, and uh, pension issues and things of that nature. And you've seen some interesting solutions, not all the same from state to state but certainly models for other states to look at and, and the federal government to observe that, hey, government can be solutions, and, and, none, and none of these cases or any of these governors trying to uh, you know, create this overwhelming government that kind of runs everything. They're just trying to deal with the things that they feel government really should have their hands in. So I think, I think that's a good story. It is a good story. And, um, yeah. and to me, it's not a partisan story because no. you know, transparency is not a partisan issue. Um, and leadership and allowing stakeholders a voice. I mean, sometimes we always think of issues, political issues, as having a partisan bent to them. But this is really a good governance question. And I think whether you're, uh, you know, right, left, Republican, Democrat, whatever, um, there's some things that Scott Walker has done that you say to yourself, I wish more were doing that, that style of leadership. And, uh, you know, if we're going to make the kind of comeback that I think we need to, we're going to need more of that. Okay. So, George, I, I want to give you the opportunity to uh, plug your organization. I believe your website is ff.org? Yep, that's correct, ff.org, Frontiers of Freedom. Okay, and if, if people go to the website, they'll be able to – I see – I have the honor, I have information sent to me, so I always have great stuff to look. But if they go there, is there a way that they can contact you guys or contact the governor to lend support in his decision mm -hmm. here? They can comment at our website. They can also sign up for email and so forth. They can contact us at, at info at ff.org. So, oh, great. Um, so, you know, and our website, of course, is ff.org. So um, they can, um, you know, we will, uh, if you go to the website, you can, uh, you know, the top story of the day will be whatever it is that day. But if you just type in, great. you know, Governor Walker, you can pull up the stories we've had on this, the letters we've sent him, things you can get involved with. Okay, excellent. And, of course, you could always help support uh, the Frontiers of Freedom. And uh, Well, George Landreth, I want to thank you so much for joining us again. It's always a pleasure to speak with you, and uh, we, uh, we appreciate the information that you guys have put out here because I, I learned quite a few things here. And uh, also, um, you know, we haven't been talking about Scott Walker all that much because we've had so many other things on our mind, but it reminds us that we do have some people we need to be thinking about in the future. Absolutely, and I appreciate the time, time, the chance to be with you. It's just been great. Okay, take care, George. Again, it's George Landreth, the president of Frontiers for Freedom, and you can go to ff.org to find out more information. Thank you.